Good morning, good morning, or good afternoon. Welcome to Walking Through the Word. I'm so glad that you're here, whether you're sitting in the room, whether you're on Zoom, whether you're watching this on Facebook, wherever you are, I could not be more excited to have you join us on our journey as we walk through the book of Ephesians. Yes, today is day one as we begin to navigate through Ephesians. For those just joining us for the first time, Walking Through the Word is what we do on Saturday mornings at 6 a.m. if you are in America or 1 p.m if you're in Kenya. And what we do is we come together and we study the books of the Bible verse by verse. We study them in context because if you take the text out of context, you have nothing more than a con. And we walk through the books of the Bible and our motivation behind it, our inspiration behind it is 2 Timothy 2.15, which tells us that we have to do everything that we can to rightly handle the word of truth. And you've heard me say it once. You probably heard me say it a thousand times. You can't rightly handle that which you don't know. And you can't rightly handle that which you don't understand. And today we are coming into our introduction to Ephesians. Introduction to Ephesians. And before we even get into the text, I want to kind of lay the foundation, give you a little bit of background on why it is we study the book of Ephesians. When you look at the book, it only consists of six chapters. You add it all together, it's 155 verses. It literally takes you about 20 minutes to read the whole book out loud. But in this little book, we find so much power and we find so much beauty. You know, um, this theologian, Klein Snodgrass said, pound for pound, Ephesians may well be the most influential document in history. I never thought about it like that. And even as I'm studying and reading through Ephesians, my eyes are being illuminated to stuff I had never seen and things I didn't understand, which makes history and the gospel make so much more sense. So what is it about this little book that makes it so influential? Why is it that we need to study it? Let's talk about Ephesians for a little while before we jump into the water of this word and we start swimming around. So why study Ephesians? Number one, Ephesians deepens our understanding of the gospel. It deepens our understanding of the gospel. You know, we literally live in a day with a whole lot of superficial Christianity. We got lots of shallow teaching going on around us. But when we dive into Ephesians, we jump into what Paul calls the incalculable riches of the Messiah. That's We see that in um, chapter 3, verse 8. You know, it's the perfect place to dive in deep and discover the true meaning of the gospel. We are going to bite, literally take the gospel and take it into bite-sized pieces. And, you know, because we need a deeper understanding of the gospel. Our lives should be gospel-driven lives. You can't be driven by something you don't know. Ephesians also magnifies the importance of the church. Probably more than any other letter in the New Testament. You know, we live in a day where people don't really value church. You know, people tend to think if nothing else is going on, if my calendar is clear, if the weather is fine, then I guess I'll go to church this weekend. We become very casual with it. We don't understand the value of the church. But when we look at the book of Ephesians, when we read how the church is central to God's eternal purposes, the church is put into an eternal perspective. You know, it is through the church that God makes known his multifaceted wisdom. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in chapter three. Another reason that we study Ephesians is lives have been forever changed by the exploration of this little book. You know, the former president of Princeton Seminary said that when he studied the book of Ephesians, he saw a new world. He saw everything differently. He had a new outlook. He had new experiences. He had a new attitude toward other people. He was quickened and made alive as he studied the book of Ephesians. And you can't hear someone describe it that way and not want to partake of it and not to have that same excitement and that same manifestation, that same newness become a part of their life. You know, also Ephesians may also be the most contemporary epistle in the New Testament. Why do I say that? As we study and as we read this book, this letter could have been written to today's church. What we're going to see is that it was a circular letter distributed and read by the churches in the Asian minor region. So it was written more generally than other specific letters. You know, he doesn't mention, Paul doesn't mention particular false teachers. He doesn't go into specific church problems or what his travel plans are. He's just talking generally to the church. He's talking now. So it's very practical. It's just as much, it's just as relevant today as it was then. 
Also, Ephesians provides grace-filled encouragement. You know, if you're in your walk and you're feeling tired, you're feeling discouraged, you're feeling beat up, lonely or confused, then welcome to Ephesians because this book has something for all of that. When we're looking into this and we're reading these verses, we need to know that Paul is talking to ordinary people just like us. You know, they had different jobs. Some were wealthy, some were poor. They, they had all these different backgrounds and perspectives. They were Christians living in the world who needed to understand who they were and how to live in that reality. They were just like us. I'm hearing the gospel. I'm believing the gospel. What does this look like lived out in my life right now? What does this look, out day, what does this look like lived out day by day? And so as we're going to be navigating through these six chapters, we need to see how Ephesians offers practical answers to basic questions about the Christian life. It's like a mini theology book and every Christian, every spirit led believer can benefit from studying it. You know, to you non-Christians who might just be curious and you're interested enough to learn what we believe. You're going to benefit from the study of the book of Ephesians. If you want to peek into why we believe what we believe, come on in. This book's going to help you understand that. And if you are a Christian, if you are a spirit-led believer, you will get a deeper understanding of what it is you are professing to believe. You know, as we look at the introduction to this letter, we're going to take a look today at just the first two verses. And then we're going to look at the overall message of the letter because I want us to, to throw out a big net today. I want us to see what we're going to be walking into over these next several weeks. We're going to look at the author. We're going to look at the recipient. We're going to look at the actual greeting of the letter. And then we're going to do an overview of the message. So welcome to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. You know, when you look at this introduction, we're going to literally see more than I'd ever seen just in these two verses. And so the, the main idea of this text is that Paul conveys his pastoral heart for the Ephesian believers by writing a letter to them that focuses on who they are in Christ and how they are to live now in light of this new identity. Not tomorrow, but now. How do I live this out now? Who am I now? How do I live now? What's my identity right now? So let's read Ephesians 1. Turn with me, verse 1 and 2. Look at it in your Bible. And again, we're taking it in bite-sized pieces. Ephesians 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What we're going to do is we're going to look a little further at the author, the recipient, the greeting, and the message of Ephesians. And we're going to look at it through the intro of these two verses. So when we look at the authors, look at verse 1, part A of that. The book opens with these words, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So right in chapter 1, verse 1, and in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says that he's the author. There are people who debate over that, but literally, Paul says he's the author. I believe it. So that's what we're going to go with. And what happens as we're looking at this letter is that he follows his usual form in this prologue. He provides three elements. He's talking to the sender. He's letting us know the he's, he's the sender, the recipient, and a greeting. We see that in all of his letters. And I want us to, to think back to Acts where we find the old Paul persecuting the church. Write this down, Acts 9, verses 1 and 2. And then I want you to think about that same Paul, that, that former Paul, that old Paul, is the same one, the one who was killing Christians, the one who was there when Stephen was murdered. He's the same one who's been made an apostle to the Gentiles. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Romans 11, 13. We studied that, how he was an apostle to the Gentiles. I want you to see those two books and those two verses coming together right here in this verse. And what I want you to look at is, as you're looking at verse one is that Paul attributes this conversion and calling to the grace of God. We see that in 1 Timothy 1, 15, the grace of God. So before his conversion, Paul was breathing these murderous threats against Christians, yet he went on to write 13 letters in the New Testament. That is true transformation. He went from an, an, a terrorist to the person who's literally writing 13 chapters, 13 letters. 
So what we need to know as we're going into this chapter is that Paul's life reminds us that God can radically change anyone. We heard a testimony Saturday, excuse me, Sunday of someone who'd been addicted to drugs for 18 years in and out of prison and they met God and their life was radically changed. The same God that changed Paul is the same God that changed Holly, the same God that can change anyone. And here we have a man who might formerly have been compared to a, a literal terrorist writing this, this letter and so much more in the New Testament. Look back at verse one. It says, Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus. He's letting us know right out the gate that his authority came from Jesus Christ. I know sometimes the word apostle is thrown away in a variety of ways, but Paul is literally saying right here that he's an apostle, not just because he gave himself that title, but he's a, an apostle by God's will. God's will. And we're going to see that important theme of God's will if literally coming back to the surface throughout the book of Ephesians, Ephesians, because he's emphasizing God's purposes. And we can't talk about God's purposes without talking about God's will. And so we're seeing right out the gate in chapter in verse one that Paul's apostleship was not of his own choosing. That takes us back to Galatians 1 16, how God had appointed him from birth for this assignment. So I want us to, to know, where is Paul writing from? We know he's writing this letter. And I want you to know that three times in the book of, of, book of Ephesians, excuse me, he mentions imprisonment. It is believed that Paul wrote this letter near the end of his two-year imprisonment in Rome, about the same time as Colossians and Philemon, around AD 62. That's what is believed. And so he was chained to Roman soldiers during this time. We read about that. But he was free to receive visitors. And so probably one of his visitors took down his words and penned this as he was talking. And so Paul then sent all three letters with one of his runners when, when he went to Rome. We talked about Tychius um, last, I think, a couple of weeks ago when we were in the book of Acts. So that goes back. So even as we are going back to these verses, as an apostle writing under the inspiration of the spirit, Paul's words should carry some weight for us today which means we need to listen and we need to listen with humility and we need to pay attention. You know, he is literally speaking to us through this letter by the spirit. And I want us to know, even as we're going into this book, that this letter is a gift from God to us and we should study and even memorize portions of it for instruction and wisdom. It's not a lot, but we need to, to know. So we talked about the author. Let's talk about the recipients. Look at part B of that verse. Paul writes, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not Ephesus was a part of the original writing here. Some earlier documents included, some omitted. I'm not even going to argue about that. My Bible has it in there. So we're going to go from that um, framework. It is believed that the churches were supposed to insert their own name there. Remember, this is a circulating letter to all those churches in the Asian Minor. So it was believed that when you read it, that you put your church to the saints who are in Oyigis, to the saints who are in North Carolina, to the saints who are in Europe, to the saints who are in Kenya, the saints who are wherever it is, you were supposed to insert your own name, your own area, your own church. So in 1 Corinthians, when we look back at that, that was a previous letter to another church that was also written from Ephesus, Paul says, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because a wide door for effective ministry has been opened for me, yet many oppose me. That's 1 Corinthians 16. In Acts 19, Paul mentions his long stay in Ephesus. I know I'm giving you some background here because we need to know what's going on and we need the mindset in which Paul is writing from. So he says in Acts 19, this long stay in Ephesus, which was about three years, the longest stay in any of his missionary journeys. He stayed there longer than anywhere else. He, he stayed three months in the synagogue, two years in the lecture hall, and even a little bit longer. We talked about that in Acts 19, verse 8, and Acts 10, verse 22. And one of the reasons for this long duration was that he had so many ministry opportunities. So when we think back to the book of Acts, when we study this, remember he did his daily public teaching in the hall of Tyrannius. These opportunities that he did, all this teaching, it came with great opposition. 
It said in Acts 20, how he served in Asia with tears and trials. Acts 20 verse 18 and 19, tears and trials. This was an easy ministry work. This wasn't easy. In 1 Corinthians 15, 32, he says he faced wild beasts in Ephesus. And this might be a figure of speech, but he could have been referencing what happened in Acts 19 in the amphitheater when these jokers came after him, when they attacked him. And I, I want you to write something down here. Just because something is difficult does not mean you moved out of the will of God. And it's important for us to know this because Paul stayed in Ephesus three years and it wasn't easy. It was difficult. He faced trials and tribulations. He cried a lot. The will of God does not mean you are free from opposition. Let me say that again. Being in the will of God does not mean you are free from opposition. The truth is this. Opposition and opportunities are often mingled together. Opportunities and opposition are often mingled together. And you got to be able to discern the difference. Lots of opportunities, lots of opposition. So what made this difficult region? What made this place difficult to minister in? First of all, it was huge. You know, Ephesus was a busy port city. It's probably the fourth or fifth largest city in the world at that time. The amphitheater that Paul talks about held 25,000 people. This city hosted athletic events similar to that of the Olympics. It was the junction of four major roads in Asia Minor. It was surrounded by several villages. It was the gateway to Asia that became the gateway of the gospel. This was a pretty important space. Acts 19.10 says Paul's ministry in the city of Ephesus reached out into all of Asia. He had great impact and great influence in this region. You know, today, you know, most of the world is urban and churches are everywhere. But I want you to picture a missionary today moving somewhere like Manhattan, New York, or someplace like Nairobi, Kenya. These big cities with an even, even bigger need for the gospel and local churches. I want you to imagine being sent to those places to spread the gospel. That's kind of what Paul had, what happened here. So, yes, it was big in size. But second of all, we need to consider the spiritual warfare in Ephesus. And if the size of the city alone was not enough to overwhelm a missionary, imagine the intense spiritual warfare happening. This city, as we've studied through the books prior to this one, was known for different forms of paganism. The city's culture was contaminated. It was drenched in sensuality, sexuality, materialism, perverted idolatry practices. We could go into all of that, but this city... This is what was happening. It was the norm. Ephesus was the home of the Roman emperor cult. They literally worshiped the emperor. Caesar Augustus was called the savior. They, these people considered the beginning of good things in the world, but his birth, that's when good stuff started to happen when he was born. They adjusted their calendar to align with his birthday because they worshiped him and they saw everything beginning and ending in him. So there was a gospel conflict happening right here in Ephesus. The coins, the statues, the temples, and other items proclaimed the gospel of Augustus. Augustus was everything. He reigned and he ruled. But now the church was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. When I mentioned the, the cult, it also was the headquarters of the cult for the Roman goddess Diana, also named also known as Artemis, whose temple was one of the seven wonders of the world. This was big. And let me be real honest with you guys. I'm not a history scholar. I, this is stuff that probably would mesmerize Eric's body. He loves history. He loves all of that. That's not my thing. But I think it's important for us to know what Paul is talking about, who he's talking to, what's going on when he was saying the same things that he was saying in this book. In order for us to truly grasp and rightly handle this, we have to know the signs of those times. We got to understand the culture to get a glimpse into these spiritually conflicted people. And as we go through the book of Ephesians, Paul uses words like authorities and power, spiritual forces. And then he begins to emphasize Jesus's lordship over it all. We have to know this is big because Ephesus was obsessed with demons, magic, idolatry, and the worship of the emperor and the worship of Diana. 
everything that opposed what it was Paul was talking about. And for us to get a, a better look at the spiritual climate in Ephesus, I want us to look back at Acts 19, 9 and 10. I want to read that to you. It says, but when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. I want you to get this because this is kind of weaved in throughout what we're going to be studying. Paul literally began his teaching in the synagogue. I told you, he spoke there for three months. Then he went to the hall of Tyrannus where he taught two years. This is a public place. So he was in the synagogue, private space. He went into the hall, which is a public space. And I want us to, to look a little closer at what's being said here. Paul went wherever there were people. Inside the synagogue, into the hall, into places. He was in the community. He was in the streets. He was everywhere teaching. I want us to see this because we need to be reminded that we can gather anywhere to teach the Bible. We don't need a temple. We don't need a special building. You can compare this hall to any place or any classroom, any space under a tree. It doesn't matter where, you know, our church here in America gathers in a community center. There's no big steeple. There's no glass stained glass windows. And during the week, it serves as a local serves the local community. And on Sunday, we serve the kingdom community. Either way, it's a space that's being utilized to share the gospel. You can be anywhere. You don't need a pulpit. You're anywhere that you are and people are becomes a platform. So Paul is showing us, yes, I'm teaching the word wherever I can teach the word, wherever the people are. He taught the word when he was making tents. Where he taught the word in houses. He taught the word. So we got to get out of this having a designated space and place to share the gospel. You should be to share the, job, share the gospel on your job. You should be to share the gospel in the market. We got to stop making it so strange and difficult to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It shouldn't be awkward to talk about Jesus. It should be just as comfortable as sharing a cup of chai with somebody. Just as comfortable as sharing a cup of coffee with someone. We've made it weird. It shouldn't be. But let's go back to Paul. While all this is going on, he's, all this teaching is going on, while he's sharing the gospel, there's a lot of demonic oppositioning, opposition happening in Ephesus. I want you to look back at Acts 19, 11 through 20. I want to read that because you need to see what was happening. You need to see the signs of the times here. And it says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Then seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva was doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were new believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced this magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and they counted the value of them and found it about 50,000 pieces of silver so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily I wanted you to see this because Paul performed miracles that was conforming excuse me confirming his message he was miracles were happening but we need to be careful in applying this account you know, let's get this acts as a narrative and narratives are descriptives, not prescriptive, meaning Luke is simply Luke is the, center, the author of acts. He's simply describing what is happening. He's not prescribing what to do. None of us are to go start an apron ministry where we're supposed to be just passing out aprons and they're supposed to heal people. That is not what we're supposed to do. Instead of us focusing on the how, I want us to look at the results of Paul's ministry here. We got to see the acts and the Ephesians connection for us to know what's going on. So what happened was in this city where, where Paul, who these people are that Paul's talking to, Jesus were exalted. People were in awe. They were amazed. And they were so in awe by what they heard, by what they saw, that they began to burn their books. 
And these books probably contain spells and other cultish practices. They literally had a spiritual awakening. They came into a revelation of who Jesus was. They saw the manifestation of his power. They believed. I want you to imagine people turning from pagan worship and cults and false religion to worship Jesus. That's what was happening. That's what happened in this city. That's what was happening in, in Ephesus. So look at Acts 19, 22 through 23. You got to know that not everybody was thrilled and happy about this movement. However, Luke mentions that Paul stayed in Asia for a while. Then he writes, during that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. Look at Acts 17 and 6. I know this is a lot of scripture, but we have to see the tie-ins. It's not enough to just read the word without studying the word. It's not enough to do surface reading. We need to do some deep dive studying so we can get revelation. We can get understanding. We can rightly handle this thing and walk it out. So when you look at Acts 17 and 6, right here in Ephesus, who Paul is talking to, the people that he's talking to, these Christians were turning the world upside down. That's what happened. They were turning it upside down. I got to hit pause and I got to ask a few questions. Can that be said about your local church? Are we impacting the city? Are we turning anything upside down for Jesus? Are we doing anything that's creating a disturbance? My prayer is this, Lord, help us to make a holy disturbance. Lord, help us to turn things upside down in the name of Jesus. Lord, help us to make a holy disturbance. Help us to start some good trouble, some good godly trouble. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I want you to notice here, in these very verses that the Christians were referred to early on as the way. Write that down. Put it in the chat. Put it somewhere. The way. Christianity was a new way of life. Christianity was a new way of life. This was the way. It was entirely different from other religions. It was centered on Jesus who said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. That's John 14 and 6. This holy disturbance we're reading about led to some serious opposition. The church in Ephesus was birthed in the middle of opposition. Real talk moment here. Living a spirit-led life comes with opposition. Opportunities and opposition. Yes, we have to be prepared for war, but we got to be confident in the Lord. That no matter the weapon we win. That we have the victory. He wrote the end of the story before the beginning. That the, the fight is fixed. We win. Yes, we got a war. Yes, we got a fight. Yes, we got to armor up. We got to suit up and we got to show up. But we show up with expectation and confidence that God is God and the Lord has got us. We walk into the opposition knowing that we're not alone. I want you to get this. In the middle of this culture, of this conflict and this crisis, we find the saints. I want you to write the word saint down throughout the book of Ephesians. It has its roots. The word saint has its root in the Old Testament, which speaks of God choosing a people from among the nations to be kingdom priests and a holy nation. We're going to see in Ephesians five and six that Christ has made us into a holy nation because we are united with him. We are united with Christ. Now we must live in a manner that's considered with our position. We have to live in response to this union. Let me say it again. Let me put it in a way we can, we can chew on this thing. Positionally, we are holy because we're united with Christ. Positionally, we are holy because we're united with Christ. It is our job to live in a manner consistent with that position. Personal holiness is about becoming in practice what we are in position. That right there is a good way, place to shout. Put your hands together for Jesus. Personal holiness is about becoming in practice what we are in position. You know, Ephesians mentions union with Christ and being in Christ more than any other level, ladder. Excuse me, like 36 times in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. It's 164 times in Paul's 13 epistles. Being in Christ is important. This is the heart of Christianity, to be united to Christ Jesus. You need to know Christians are people who are in Christ. You are united in his death and you are united in his resurrection. We're going to talk about that in chapter 2. It's only by being in Christ can you have access 
to every spiritual blessing. We talk about the blessings. We talk about the gifts. We want to talk about them being available. They are available to those that are in him. They're not available to those that are not. If you're in union with Christ, then you have access to the blessings. If you're not in union, you don't. If you are in Christ, Christ's riches are your riches. His resources are your resources. His righteousness is your righteousness. His power is your power. His position is your position. Where he is, we are. What he has, we have. That's for those who are in Christ. And because we're in Christ, though opposition surrounds us on every side, we are secure in him. You got to know that your identity is in Christ, not your performance, not your popularity, not your productivity, and not your prominence. Let me repeat that. Your identity is in Christ, not your performance, not your popularity, not your productivity, not your pro proeminence, not your prominence. It's not. It's not. It's not. So let's get to verse two, the greeting, verse two, the greeting, you know, in verse two, he writes grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This greeting is the same type of greeting Paul uses for his other letters. But what we need to understand when Paul says grace, circle that in your Bible, he is not saying hello, but he's really praying for grace to come to the Ephesians. You know, Paul is like the theologian of grace. Grace runs through the letter and it appears 12 times. The same here is true for peace. Paul is praying for God to bring peace to his readers. His prayer wish is what introduces the letter, which would have been read aloud during corporate worship. He's literally saying the grace and peace that comes from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what I'm praying for you. That is what I'm declaring for you. He's doing this because his mind is filled with Jesus. And I want you to make a note of this. Paul opens up this letter with grace and peace. And he closes out chapter six with grace and peace. He bookends the book of Ephesians with grace and peace. So lastly, I want to give a quick overview over the message. Over the message, as we're looking in the book of Ephesians, you know, the key thought in Ephesians is in Christ. Write that down somewhere in your notes. You know, Ephesians shows us that God is forming a new humanity through Christ by his spirit. It's describing how Jesus Christ died for sinners, was raised, exalted above all competitors, and now is the head of the cosmos and the church. That's what he's teaching. Through our union with Christ, we share in this. We've been raised with Christ. We're seated with him. This great salvation that we have, this relationship, this union that we have is because of grace. And as we look at the book of Ephesians, we're going to look at it in two parts. The first part is who we are in Christ, our position. And the second part is how we are to live in Christ, our practice. When we look at our position, who we are in Christ, that's going to be Ephesians chapter 1. And that's going to go all the way through chapter 3, verse 21. It's going to be talking about our position, who we are in Christ, our position, our placement. He's going to focus on that. And so when we're looking at these opening chapters, we're going to read about how God saves sinners through Jesus Christ. He's granting them spiritual life, how this union happens. The focus is not on what we must do, but what on what God has already done for us. As we're looking, we are we now have new life in Christ. He's coming back to that through the through Jesus' sacrifice. Through that atonement, through all those words we've been talking about, justification, redemption, sanctity, all that stuff we've been talking about. We now have new life in Christ. And as we're studying in those first few chapters, we read that Christianity is not about becoming religion. It's not about conforming to a list of rules. It's not about adopting a philosophy. It's not about financial prosperity. It is not about what I got. And what I do, it's about becoming a new person. It's about going from death to life. It's about coming out of darkness and going into light. You know, Paul's task is to not call people to religion, but to call people to Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life. And guess what? That's our same job. It hasn't changed. And as we go through chapter two and chapter three, we, we learn that we have a new community in Christ. Not only am I in Christ, but we have a new community in Christ. When God saves sinners, he brings them into a new community. 
This new community is called his church and is made up of the different types of people, varying people, all united in Jesus. You know, we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Chapter 2 and 19, we've been talking about the church. We've been talking about the family of God because this is where we need to grow up. We belong to something that exists to display the glory of God. His church is putting his glory on display. We belong to the church of the living God. We do. When you become a Christian, you belong to God. You belong to brothers. You belong to sisters in him. We do. And we have to know if the church is the body of Christ, we shouldn't be living as disembodied Christians. We shouldn't be living broken. This body shouldn't be broken. The hands over there, the foot's over there, the knees over there. No, we should be connected. We were saved for community. We were saved for kingdom purposes. We were saved to do, to fulfill the mandate given to the church. We are the church and we come together to fulfill the assignment he's given to the universal church. And you got to ask yourself, are you living out of your corporate identity by belonging to a local visible church? I'm not mad at online church. I'm not mad. But are you connected to a body where somebody's praying for you? Are you connected to a body that you're able to encourage other people? You don't just come to get, but you're part of something that you get to give. Do you have brothers and sisters with whom you serve, whom you love, whom you weep, whom you rejoice and whom you celebrate? Do you have a church family that, that you're doing life together? And then the second part of Ephesians is our practice. It talks about how we're to live in Christ. And that's chapter four through chapter six, verse 24. You know, in the second half of the letter, Paul is shifting. He turns his attention to the responsibilities of the saints, responsibilities of spirit led believers. You know, in chapters four and five, he tells us that we must now pursue unity. We must pursue purity in Christ. In chapters five and six, he says we must now pursue submissiveness and stability in Christ. He deep dives how we should live out spirit-filled relationships. He talks about pursuing harmony at work and at home and in church. And this book closes out giving us a vivid imagery of our spiritual battle against the devil. And he's telling us by the power of God, we're to take our stand. When we're looking at the book of Ephesians, when we do the, the overview of it, it's teaching us about living our life. It's about a whole new life in Christ, a whole, whole new way of living. It's about reflecting who the word says we are. It's our position. And then our position should be bagged up with our practice. I think re religion has you practicing without relationship. It has you practicing without position. You know, as new people in Christ, as people of new identities, we need to pursue different lifestyles than the surrounding culture. We shouldn't look like the world. We shouldn't smell like the world. We shouldn't talk like the world. We shouldn't act like the world. Our money shouldn't be going to all the same places of the world. We should be in it and out of it. And I need us to know something, that this challenge that was made to Ephesus is the same challenge we're making today. It's a battle to not conform to culture, to not, not, to not be trained in tradition. It's a battle to not drift into those rituals and religion and all of that. The final thing I want to point out before we walk through the, the last phase, and excuse me, the last phrase in Ephesians 6, 23 and 24 is I want, us to, I want us to look at the end of this thing because I think it's important that we go into the, the book of Ephesians with the end in mind. You have to be mindful of the end. You got to be mindful of the end. And we hear this, we talk about this, we read it, but I think it's important that we tie these pieces together because the book of Ephesians is talking about and going to teach us to not lose our first love. To not lose our first love. When you're looking at Ephesians 6, 23 and 24, where Paul closes his letter, He's, he's telling them, I need you to love Jesus purely and simply. Love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Because as we read the book of Ephesians, it should increase our love for Jesus. It should increase our love for Jesus. But I need you to think about this as we're going on this walk through the book. 
it was the church in Ephesus that had an amazing history. We're learning about how, you know, all of the miracles that were performed, all the things that happened. But the final mention of this church is in Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Why is that important to know? This great church abandoned the love that they had at first. I want you to think about Ephesus. This is where Priscilla and Aquila came from. Apollos, Paul, Timothy, later John, they all ministered at this church. They all went there and worked. Yet 40 years after the first, after the first generation of believers, they lost their love. Just 40 years after these amazing men and women of God ministered in this place, shared the gospel, they saw miracles. They saw healing. They saw deliverance. They saw the gospel lived out. They lost their love. They knew the truth. But the question is, were they just going through the motions? Did they not fan the flame? What happened to this church? We got to stop and ask ourselves, is our service to Jesus mechanical? Do we love him or are we just using him for our own ambitions? Are we doing things and slapping for Jesus on it because we want him to do what we want him to do? We want him to give us what we want him to give us. We want our life to look a certain way. So we think if we do this for him, if we do this in his name, if we do this and we say we are doing it because we love him. But is our hearts far from him? Is our ambition driving us? Or our awe for the King of Kings. You know, when we get to Revelation, Jesus told them to repent. Because that's what we have to do if we lost our love for Christ. We got to return to exalting Jesus for who he is and what he's done. You know, as we walk through the book of Ephesians over the next few months, I want us to find places and spaces that we can just sit. And we can be saturated with what God has done and who Jesus is. That literally allows us to get to a place where we're exalting, worshiping, and adore him. You know, my prayer as we navigate through these next several weeks is may our fires be rekindled. May our love grow stronger. May our understanding of the gospel be based on position and evident in practice. May it grow beyond our wildest imagination. May we grow up in Jesus. May our love for Jesus grow. May our roots and understanding grow and may our practice grow in his name. Now, your up close and personal this week is simple. How would you describe the temperature of your relationship with Jesus? How would you describe the temperature of your relationship with Jesus? We want you to pray for your love for Christ to be increased through our study of Ephesians. Be honest about your temperature. Be honest about your temperature. I want to encourage you to partner with us. I want you to sow a seed. We share the gospel and we meet practical needs. We're preparing now to head to, to Kenya for Awakening 2024. And we're believing for partners. For people to sow as the Lord leads. Not out of, you know, you you feel like you gotta. But we want people to sow because they get to. The ways to give it on the screen, that QR code on the screen will take you directly to the website for you to give. So that we can do what God has called us to do. We can continue to share the gospel. You know, join us in the Zoom room. The meeting ID is on the screen. Passwords there. We're going to talk a little bit more about the lesson. And also have a time of prayer. If you are watching online, drop any prayer requests that you may have in the chat. Um, so that we can make sure we cover them and you in prayer. Know that we're about to start this journey. We just looked at one and two today to kind of lay the foundation of where we're going. And I believe God has taken us higher and he's taken us deeper at the same time. Next week, we're going to look at Ephesians 1 verses 3 to, through 14. And we're going to talk about whom do you worship? Because the reality is everybody worships something. Everybody worships someone. The question is who and the question is what. So I look forward to seeing you on next Saturday. Same place, same time. Until then, do you on Max and Jesus. God bless you. Have an amazing week.